Welcome uh, everybody to uh, Circe Summit Lightning Talks Room One. Uh, we'll have three presentations. Uh, the first uh, presentation is Improving Precision and Power in Randomized Trials for COVID-19 Treatments Using Covariate Adjustment for Binary Ordinal and Time Event Outcomes, and will be uh, presented by Michael Rosenblum uh, from uh, Johns Hopkins University. Thank you for the opportunity to present. Uh, I'll be speaking about improving precision and power in randomized trials for COVID-19 treatments using covariate adjustment for binary, ordinal, and time-to-event outcomes. Um, this is The slides and the paper are available at my website uh, listed here. And the co-authors, this is work from a recently published paper in Biometrics, and the co-authors are David Benkeiser, Ivan Diaz, Alex Ludka, Jody Siegel, and Daniel Sharfstein. I want to especially acknowledge the first three authors who they did the heavy lifting um, and really led this work. The background is that there are over 800 uh, randomized clinical trials, that's phase two and three, of COVID-19 treatments registered at clinicaltrials.gov. And think of a year ago, uh, almost a year ago, in March 2020, the FDA requested statistical analysis recommendations for the onslaught of COVID-19 trials that were getting registered. Um, and they reached out to the, some of the CERCES to ask for uh, advice. And at the Hopkins CERCE, we assessed, um, in collaboration with everyone I mentioned on the previous slide, we assessed the potential value added by covariate adjustment in these trials by simulating two arm um, hypothetical trials with one-to-one -one randomization. And to make the simulations realistic, the, we used, we sampled from uh, data, a uh, resample from data on over 500 patients hospitalized at New York Presbyterian Hospital who were COVID positive, and also a, a set of cases from the uh, CDC. And we submitted our report with, uh, which I'll dis discuss in a moment. Um, with recommendations, and our main recommendation is that people should strongly consider using covariate adjustment in these trials to improve precision and power. And then a month later, the FDA, after we sent this to them, FDA put out a guidance document for COVID trials, and one of their recommendations was perfectly aligned with what we suggested, which is considering covariate adjustment. So, what is covariate adjustment? Um, it's one of my most. I'm one of the statistical methods I'm most passionate about, and in a randomized trial, it means pre-planned adjustment for baseline variables when estimating the average treatment effect in a primary efficacy analysis. And if you have variables at measured before randomization that are correlated with the outcome, you can improve precision and reduce the required sample size needed without sacrificing power, and it costs nothing. It's a, the, one of the closest things to a free lunch of statistics I've ever seen. And I didn't come up with this. This has been known for a long time, but the problem is that covariate adjustment is often misunderstood and underutilized, potentially wasting substantial resources, particularly for trials with binary ordinal or time to event outcomes, which is often the case in COVID-19 trials. So what I'll talk about applies to any kind of trial, um, not just COVID-19, but it's especially useful there. And so our approach is we use simulations based on real data to demonstrate the potential benefit or the, just the impact of covariate adjustment um, and our main results, to cut to the chase, uh, the, there were, we found substantial precision gains from adjusting for baseline variables, covariate adjustment, equivalent to reducing the sample size needed to, from between 4 to 18%, um, and again, at no cost. And so that would lead to quicker, um, quicker uh, knowledge, uh, evidence generation about which treatments work and which don't work. And we provide our package and practical recommendations on how to do this. And as I mentioned, there's the FDA, after we sent our report with these, most of these results in April, saying we recommend people use covariate adjustment, FDA said a similar thing in their guidance that came out uh, the month later, which is the quotes at the bottom. It says to improve, they said it very eloquently, to improve the precision of treatment effect estimation and inference, sponsors should consider adjusting for pre-specified prognostic baseline covariates, that just means variables, for example, age, baseline severity, and comorbidities, those are known, as an aside, those are known to be correlated with, um, with bad outcomes, um, and, and should propose how to do it. Um, and our contribution is we're, we're, we're telling how some methods to do that. Um, and in my last 30 seconds, I'll just tell, um, if you go to rosenbloom.jhu.edu, 
the, that's where papers and open source software for doing this is. And we also handle stratified randomization. And there are also tools for a topic unrelated to this talk, but another area I work on um, also with some collaboration with FDA is adaptive enrichment trial designs. So we have trial planning tools, uh, it's all open source, trial planning tools, a short course and video recording that, would, that uh, I taught at the FDA um, and some other materials. And I will stop there. Thank you all very much. I'd love if you reach out with any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. A great presentation. We'll have some time for Q&A um, in, in a few minutes. Uh, the next presentation is the iSpy COVID trial, adapting lessons learned in oncology to combat the pandemic. It'll be presented by Carolyn Caffey. So my name is Carolyn Caffey. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here to talk today about this topic. So how did uh, oncology and critical care come together in the Ice by COVID trial? I think probably most of the people at this meeting are familiar with the Ice by 2 clinical trial led by Laura Esserman pictured here, which is the paradigmatic adaptive platform trial that's set in breast cancer. It really paved the way for biomarker guided adaptive clinical trials and is a phase two engine that's tested over 20 drugs in a variety of biomarker signatures over the past decade. The condition I study is called ARDS or the acute respiratory distress syndrome, which is a common cause of acute hypoxemic respiratory failure, not due to heart failure and requiring mechanical ventilation. And as the name implies, it's a syndrome that contains substantial clinical, biologic and pathologic heterogeneity like the term breast cancer perhaps. Our group for the past decade or so has been working on identifying distinct biologic and clinical phenotypes within the syndrome of ARDS that have differential treatment responses. And so when I had the opportunity to take a sabbatical in 2018, I was fortunate to work with Dr. Esserman's group with the goal of about learning about how to think about matching biomarker subtypes with specific therapies in an adaptive trial design. And Laura and I thought, well, maybe this is something that we'll do in a few years, um, you know, when the field progresses a little bit further in ARDS. And then came COVID-19, which is essentially a pandemic of ARDS. Nearly all critically ill COVID-19 patients develop ARDS and there are no pharmacotherapies that improve ARDS outcomes despite decades of clinical trials uh, and curing mouse ARDS many times over. And during the pandemic, of course, hospitals were awash with ARDS with no proven treatments to offer other than supportive care. So Laura called me and said, Carolyn, the time is now, we've got to do it now. Um, and we recruited Kathleen Liu, MD, PhD, who's a colleague of mine at UCSF and a critical care clinical trialist to serve as co-PI. We've had a lot of opportunities with this trial that I'll tell you about in just a moment, including the unprecedented focus and energy devoted to COVID-19 treatment on the part of clinicians, pharma, the FDA, and really patients and families who have been incredibly enthusiastic about participating. We had a connection established between intensivists and oncologists, not just from my sabbatical, but also from an NHLBI workshop held in October 2019, where we focused on precision medicine in ARDS and developing novel trial designs. Laura's group had a team in place with experience with adaptive platform design and many of the regulatory and statistical issues involved. And of course, we had ample eligible patients. But we also had a lot of challenges. There was no established network that was interested in taking this on. We had no established funding. Because of the pandemic, of course, we had an extremely compressed timeline for trial setup and launch. And in the ICU, we always have a very compressed timeline for patient enrollment and stratification. We didn't have real-time availability of the biomarkers that we've been using to identify our subtypes of ARDS. And of course, it goes without saying that the clinicians, investigators involved have been under tremendous personal and professional stress with changing standards of care. So this is the trial that we have designed and launched. Um, it targets patients who have WHO COVID level five or higher disease, meaning high flow oxygen or more severe. The trial has a backbone of remdesivir and dexamethasone, which are currently the standard of care treatment in the US, at least for this condition. And we have up to four agents in the trial at a time with a master protocol approved by the FDA with each drug having its own amendment. We also have a real world observation alarm for patients that are ineligible or decline. We're not currently stratifying by biomarker profile, but we are obtaining biospecimens for future studies. This is a phase two design with the goal to identify big signals and the primary endpoint is time to durable COVID level four, which is nasal cannula oxygen or lower for more than 48 hours. And Michael, I'll tell you that we are going to be adjusting a priori in the primary analysis for baseline severity of illness. Way to go. Okay. <laughs> we are using a Bayesian statistical design with 50 to 125 subjects per arm. 
The trial was launched on July 31st, and we now have 17 sites activated and 13 enrolling that you can see here on the map with an additional 12 sites and additional integrated delivery networks currently in process. As of January uh, 20, 20, as of today, actually, we have nearly 600 patients enrolled, including 353 to the interventional arms. We have the first four agents in the trial listed here with uh, two agents on deck next up, as you can see listed here. We've developed a system of real-time data entry using a streamlined case report form, a pipeline of agents with new proposals being evaluated every two weeks, and funding has been provided by Fast Grants, DITRA, BARDA, and the companies that are providing the agents. So as I'm closing here, I just wanna to speak to a few of the lessons that we've learned and ongoing challenges. This is my last slide. First of all, the trial was more complex than we had anticipated to launch. Even with a lot of prior thought and planning, it took us more than four months to open the trial. And by that time, the recovery trial in the UK had already enrolled more than 6,000 patients and published in the New England Journal. Now there are different care delivery systems and regulatory environments that contribute, and we can talk about those in the questions. Clearly multidisciplinary teamwork was required here with both content expertise in critical care and design expertise in the design um, of the platform trial and statistical knowledge. We did face regulatory challenges, including a range of different approaches to the master protocol format and pragmatic trial design within the FDA and the fact that critically ill patients all have adverse events every day. And so dealing with that uh, remains a challenge perpetually for critical care clinical trials. And then of course, there are many demands on ICU providers and investigators time, as well as different responses to the pandemic at different sites that have influenced, for instance, our ability to deliver nebulized treatments like Pulmazine. Uh, I just wanna leave this slide up momentarily to say this has been a huge team effort um, involving all the people here. And I'd be happy to talk more about this in the questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, our next presentation, our final presentation in the session before we go to Q&A is Vaccine Platforms for Rapid Product Development. And this will be presented by Wilbur Chen from University of Maryland. All right, hopefully you can hear me and yes. see my slides as well. Um, so I'm gonna be painting in broad strokes. And in fact, some of this information to the folks at, within CBER uh, Office of Vaccines Research and Review. Uh, but let's see. Um, so first of all, uh, talking about emerging infections, it's really an inevitability. Um, once we get past this pandemic, uh, we are bound to encounter the next emerging pathogen. So I'm just painting uh, an overview over the past just 25 years and some of the uh, remarkable pathogens that have been encountered that were pre-pandemic potential or became true pandemics. And so in, in bold, you can see SARS and MERS in 2003 and 2012, respectively, uh, COVID-19. But you'll also recognize uh, things like Ebola, Zika, or dengue as other pathogens as well, which continue to be an emerging threat even when we finish this present pandemic. So this really paints the image of um, us being able to uh, rapidly go through a stage of uh, discovery and developing vaccines and therapeutics as well um, in remarkable speed so that we can respond to the next pandemic. So what I'm concentrating on here today, just in broad strokes, is this discovery preclinical stage, where again, uh, my argument is that we need to have a number of platform technologies in order to be able to respond quickly. So how are we able to do it this time? And how are we going to be able to do it in the future? Well, one of the things is uh, that we have rapid sequencing of pathogens once we identify them. Uh, we have ways now, and we continue to build upon this, this kind of knowledge, is uh, prediction tools uh, to help us to uh, understand what are going to be the critical epitopes, what are the antigens of interest among these pathogens that would allow us to uh, create protective responses with vaccines and or for therapeutics uh, for us to target antigens of interest or targets of interest. And we need to be able to, in the, in the context of vaccines, express these critical epitopes. And how can we do them? We use these various uh, vaccine platforms, again, because we want to elicit protective immunity as soon as possible. So what do I mean by these vaccine platforms? And uh, you know, I'm giving you just a very wide overview of the history of vaccines. So the traditional approach 
which is a decades old approach, which we still use to make uh, the predominance of our influenza vaccines every year. The annual influenza vaccine is made by chicken's eggs, in which we basically take the viruses uh, and grow them to large amounts in chicken's eggs, in millions of chicken's eggs. And after a few days of incubation, we uh, crack them open and centrifuge them, purify them, uh, those components, and eventually those are made into our subunit vaccines for influenza every year. So this is an old technology. We have now newer approaches. So again, live attenuated vaccines. So this includes flu mist, live attenuated uh, influenza vaccine, but we also have measles vaccine, which is a live attenuated vaccine. We have yellow fever vaccine and others. We have recombinant protein approaches in which we basically can take that antigen, that protein of interest and express it from uh, recombinant expression through uh, bacterium of interest. We have cell, cell culture based technologies in which we can, instead of using a chicken's egg, use uh, cell culture based techniques to replicate those viruses or those pathogens to large amounts so that we can make the uh, vaccines. And we can add uh, immunostimulating adjuvants to our vaccines. Um, and these, uh, you know, an example is Shingrix, which is a highly successful vaccine against shingles. And uh, it's highly effective against older adults, which again are uh, relatively immunocompromised, they're immunosenescent. And so adding adjuvants has been a very successful approach to those vaccines. So these are broad platform-based approaches that can be applied to any pathogen of interest once we identify those critical epitopes. And then there are the future approaches, which now we can say that there are EUA-approved uh, products based on these. So in the future, I'll have to rename this to the newest approaches. But you know, DNA and mRNA-based approaches are, uh, again, now familiar in our lexicon because of the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines using mRNA. Uh, we have viral vectored vaccines for which the AstraZeneca and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine are based on taking a virus that has been weakened and then uh, using genomics, being able to express the antigen of interest. And the antigen, again, in all instances for this present pandemic is the spike protein the glycoprotein that studs the outer surface of the virus. And then if we have some vaccines that can be on a broad platform-based approach based on viral-like particles, virosomes, or nanoparticles. So these are the platforms that have been uh, researched upon for many years, even before this present pandemic, and allowed us to very quickly be able to respond to this present pandemic. So here's some examples. So in Ebola uh, that broke out in West Africa in 2014, we had a number of vaccines using some of these similar technologies. And in fact, uh, Merck has now an approved technology based on uh, recombinantly uh, expressing viral vector vaccine. These are some other viral vector vaccines. Zika that broke out in 2015, again, mRNA-based technologies, DNA-based technologies, viral vector-based technologies were broad platform-based technologies that were being used to respond quickly to that situation. Again, those did not break out to a global pandemic, but they had pandemic potential. And we were able to respond in kind by recognizing those pathogens early on, sequencing them, and then making these uh, newer vaccines. CEPI is an organization uh, that uh, in recent years has uh, been doing uh, work uh, based on a proposed disease X. So again, uh, using these broad platforms, uh, trying to make vaccines so that, again, we have an understanding of a technology so that we can use them very quickly. And so the more that um, our regulators understand well, well, please, and are uh, familiar please with sum these, up, uh... Okay, so we have a number of leading vaccines that are using all of these technologies. And again, this is just to say that these broad platform technologies are going to be extremely useful for us to respond to the next pandemic. And I'll thank you. This is just a, a picture metaphor of the situation that we're in, and hopefully we're going to be saved by a whale's tail. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great presentations. So we'll go right to the questions. Uh, Sabrina asks a question to Professor Rosenblum. Uh, populations, often diverse populations, are excluded from clinical trials because of comorbidities. Could covariate adjustment be a method to mitigate risk and promote diversity in trials? So, yeah, it's a great question. And the answer is essentially it, it can mitigate some of the risk, um, depending on how much of the outcome variability can be explained by the baseline variables. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm always for 
trials with a more diverse um, patient population because it will be more generalizable, the results of it, um, and recruitment rate will be increased. Um, though the, on the end covariate adjustment can help reduce the added variability, some of it, um, but there's not a guarantee it will take care of all of it. Uh, if, and another factor there to consider though is treatment effect heterogeneity. If some populations benefit more than others, or maybe some populations don't benefit at all from a treatment while others do, when you mix populations like that, you can't you can't um, remove the increased variance from due to that by adjustment. So if you're if by expanding the population you start to introduce more treatment effect heterogeneity, that that will you, you can't adjust your way out of that. So that's a, a trade off. The, the methods you're working on are they? Uh, I mean, are they? Can they be used for other? Um infectious diseases in other areas, they're not, they're certainly not specific just to COVID. I guess maybe COVID has resulted in you, um, you know, the, the evolution of these methods, but can you speak more broadly to how these methods might be used uh, for other diseases as well? Yes, thanks for asking. Yeah, so there's really, the, the only thing special about COVID, why we seized the opportunity to write a paper about this, is um, that COVID has, I think everyone, uh, not to scientists, knows that there are certain things that predispose people to worse outcomes if they uh, get COVID, things like older age, comorbidities. Um, and when, whenever you have variables that are predictive of bad outcomes, regardless of the treatment you're getting, uh, that should make you think, if you're designing a trial, it should make you think of you should do some covariate adjustment and you should pre-plan it in the trial. So it applies to any infectious disease and not even infectious disease. It goes beyond that. It can be, I've applied it in stroke trials, Alzheimer's disease trials, HIV prevention and treatment trials. Uh, that I could keep going. The, um, and sometimes you, you can get substantial benefits. We're not just talking about 1% improvement. We're, sometimes it can be up to 25% uh, for stroke trials, for example. Um, you can reduce the sample size you need by about 25%. Uh, and sometimes you don't get much benefit, but there's no cost. There's essentially no cost as long as the trial is not too small. Great, great. Uh, Dr. Kelty, I have a question for you. For those who are not all that familiar with uh, the background of iSpy trials, could you share how uh, a company, for example, that is working in another therapeutic area, not in oncology, but has a molecule that they think may be helpful for oncology, how to how do these find their way into iSpy trials? Could you just sort of share with us? Because uh, I've certainly seen some examples of that. Uh, and I'm wondering, I was wondering if you could give sort of a broad overview of how that might happen. Well, so I can't really comment on the oncology trials because I'm not really part of the iSpy2 group. I can comment on this for iSpy COVID. And I think the approach is quite similar, which is basically that we have a, an agents committee that's made up of a variety of different um, experts from critical care, from oncology, from uh, you know pharmaceutical industry and drug design, and that companies that are interested in proposing an agent um, or scientists that are interested in proposing an agent contact us. And then these agents are presented at that agents committee. Um, and then um, we have uh, basically a, a discussion with all the involved stakeholders as to whether or not, you know, it seems to be worth pursuing further. Um, so, you know, certainly in COVID, I think there have been a lot, there's been a lot of interest in repurposed drugs, right? And drugs that have, I mean, pretty much all of these drugs uh, are, are repurposed drugs, right? And so there's been a lot of interest in that. And that's, um, you know, we've, we've gotten referrals from a variety of different places, I would say, but they basically go through that process of being evaluated by an agent's committee. Excellent. So uh, last question for Dr. Chen uh, here in terms of the vaccine platforms that you're working on. Uh, are there people working on such platforms in areas of the world where some of the, uh, you know, some strains of, some novel strains of viruses that can cause pandemics uh, may emerge sooner than we may see in the United States? Uh, is, there, is there community work being done uh, that could be helpful for rapid product development in those settings? Well, I think that the best example is that the WHO has a surveillance system that has been in place for multiple years uh, looking for uh, emerging influenza viruses. And so these are avian influenza viruses and other viruses um, among zoonotic animals. And so uh, again, using this kind of a inter international network allows us to look for other types of emerging viruses as well, Zika, Ebola, and others 
So uh, yes, there are uh, international communities looking for these types of viruses to break out. Excellent, excellent. Well, I think we're we're at time here. Uh, thank. We want to thank everyone. Uh, there's uh, a couple of comments on the chat saying, if possible, please include contact information and website links about uh, these presenters. I think there's a lot of interest in your talks uh, among students, and uh, anything you, you share with us, we'll we'll try to make available to others. And I noticed that Dr. Uh, Rosenblum has already shared some content, and uh, but I want to thank each of the speakers for wonderful talks. Uh, and uh, wish you all the best in your in your future uh, research pursuits.